So good morning, uh, everyone. A warm welcome uh, from the eFree team. Uh, it's great to have you here. We have had for a long time a tradition of uh, energy breakfast discussions uh, in person in Brussels. Um, so this is the restart uh, after uh, several uh, problematic years, as you imagine, when we moved online. But uh, it's 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 great to have you all around the table. Uh, I think, uh, and I hope the format is efficient uh, and that the location is uh, also uh, easy for all of you. Um, as you know, at IFRI, uh, Center for Energy and Climate, we are working on the geopolitics and geoeconomics of uh, the European energy tran uh, transition and of the uh, global energy system and transformation. And uh, the core question that currently drives uh, our work is whether uh, the European Union can strive and succeed economically, uh, politically, institutionally, socially, in realizing its climate ambition in, in moving the Green Deal agenda forward uh, and drive global change. And, and, and of course, the new environment you're all aware of is extraordinarily complicated. Uh, we aim and we are the OECD front runner. Others do not have the same comprehensive policies. They do not have the same super ambitious targets. Um, we have uh, the highest energy prices, uh, some of the highest in the OECD, if not the highest, it depends. But uh, I mean, this is a new reality that is of super high concern. Still above 50% of our gross energy production is imported. And I think that is also a, a huge problem uh, if we consider uh, the OECD average and our competitors in the OECD and non-OECD. Last year's trade deficit in goods was well over 300 billion euros. And what is also concerning in this perspective is that we have a growing trade deficit in clean goods. That is wind, solar, and it's just gone to reach 10 billion euros. And it's rising by about two and or two and a half billion per year. So I think that is also very concerning. And the problem is, as we aim to reindustrialize in this area, we have the highest electricity prices. So it's not compatible. And, and it's a huge issue, of course. Of course, we have insufficient low uh, carbon technology deployment, scarce low carbon electricity, scarce industrial equipment, scarce skilled manpower. Uh, we are the only one with such strong sticks. I mean, they are clearly useful if we want to achieve the objectives, but we are the only one to have these, the ETS, the removal of free uh, uh, allowances, the regulations, et cetera. High, very high public debt and the interest rates are rising by the day, which brings a huge burden to future public finances. No agreement on the energy mix and a will by some member countries to steer the energy mix. And I think that is a, a growing concern. And so all in all, um, I think uh, we, we shouldn't understate really, I mean, the, the, the issue of the industrial transformation and the reindustrialization that we need here. So a lot of work is happening. We'll have the European Council tomorrow. Um, clearly the lines are moving. It's all going to the right direction, but the IRA uh, shock that we see is not so much about the money. Uh, it's not so much about the fact that, uh, you know, it's about made in USA, et cetera. It's really about the fact that it's extraordinarily powerful and efficient. It's, it's just very different to what we are setting up in Europe. And, and we need the simplification shock as well in Europe, I think. And we need to move much faster because this is exactly what the Americans are doing. Um, you know, we have another big problem, which is this remaining ideological footprint in all current very important legislations in Brussels. And so to come up with a French perspective on that, two points I'd like to make. The first is our view, and we are convinced that actually we will be, uh, we will not have sufficient nuclear energy, we will not have sufficient renewables, we will not have sufficient grids, we will not have uh, sufficient raw materials to do all that. And so when I read in the letter written by several ministers a few days ago, that actually, if we include low carbon hydrogen uh, in the renewable directive, well, we will run short in deploying renewables. I mean, for me, it's a nonsense because we must deploy renewables at all costs as far as possible, and we will need them for the electrification purposes. And even if we uh, are very optimistic on our ability to meet our targets, we will in any case be short in renewable electricity and flexibility tools, et cetera. So we have to be responsible and realistic. And the other, and the other reason uh, why we are so concerned is that 
you know, in France, uh, we just had in the parliament, parliamentary hearings, um, uh, and the committee uh, hearing was entitled the reason why uh, we are facing an energy demise in France. So basically EDF, 60 billion debt, uh, and uh, and how come we came to this situation? And 88 stakeholders, including former presidents, were uh, auditioned. And what is very striking is that actually the debate, there is many reasons for that, but the debate is increasingly about Germany dominating European policies, imposing its bad ideas on others, and uh, and and the European Commission being co-responsible. And we are just a few months before the next electoral campaign. And, and I think uh, we shouldn't understate the massive damage, political damage this is causing. It's very deep-rooted. And we shouldn't consider that because of the war in Ukraine, because of the EU reaction to the pandemic, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, the populists and the demagogues uh, are, are basically out of business and that, you know, it's getting mainstream again. Uh, I think uh, we are entering very dangerous times there. And so a reason should prevail, hopefully rapidly, on the field of nuclear and, and, and hydrogen in Europe. And, and the last point, and this is more related to our discussion today, uh, we are, A, very concerned by uh, carbon fragmentation in Europe, and B, we are very. Uh, we obviously see that we should focus much more on Central Europe, where France actually sees its new allies and the nuclear uh, alliance that was set up as many Central European member countries. And I think we have the same realistic, pragmatic policies that is to boost renewables, boost nuclear, and and try the best we can with all the available low carbon technologies. And the last uh, element in that is that obviously there's a lot happening in Central Europe. So we are very very pleased to have this discussion today with our great speakers around the table and including the Czech presidency that we had uh, uh, in the six months of last year, which uh, did a tremendous job. And so without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome you once again and to pass the floor to my colleague Diana Gerasim, who runs our European Green Deal Energy Programme at IFRI and uh, who will moderate uh, and uh, organize our discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marc Antan, and good morning to everyone. I'll be very short uh, because we have a lot of uh, interventions today. Uh, just wanted to give you a, a brief overview of uh, what we will discuss today. So Central and Eastern European countries, 10 member states that we have been looking at, uh, very different realities, as you can see in that table, but a red thread uh, among, uh, among them all, they have a lower um, GDP per, per capita than the European uh, average. Um, and also, uh, just to keep in mind, 11% of the of the European GDP represented by those countries and 22% of the population. How does the energy transition look like in those countries? So until 2010, uh, the emissions have been growing. After 2010, they have been uh, decreasing. They have declined by 10%. Um, and uh, of course, this is a good thing. It means that these countries uh, see a Europeanization of their energy uh, agenda. Uh, because this uh, 2010 corresponds to also the implementation of, of the first uh, energy and climate package with 2020 targets to which these countries have actually to the negotiations they, they participated. Um, I, I will uh, also uh, just add that the pr uh, pressure is mounting uh, because we, had 50, we have 50 for 55 targets. Uh, we have the European Green Deal. Um, which is very challenging for these countries, uh, but also we see some good signs uh, emerging in terms of challenges. You can see that uh, the total number of electric vehicles sold in, in these 10 countries amounts to the number of electric vehicles sold in Austria. Uh, Romania has 70 times less uh, charging points than Netherlands. Uh, these are statistics that, uh, that speak for themselves, um, but then in terms of good signs, we see that Poland and Czech Republic are, are very dynamic markets for uh, heat pump sales, and Poland has, uh, has made a major step in, in terms of adding uh, renewable capacity, 5 gigawatt almost in, in 2022, third place in, in Europe in terms of uh, additions. Um, and also uh, a great uh, market for, for solar jobs. So uh, great um, things to, to keep in mind for the discussion. We will look at the implementation. We will look at further negotiations this year. And I will uh, give the floor for the keynote speech to Mr. Jakub Czernohorski, representing the, the permanent representation uh, of Czech Republic here in Brussels. Thank you for being with us. 
Thank you very much, especially for the invitation. I, <laughs> I'm glad that um, you decided to invite me. Uh, on the other hand, I can see many more people that are far more experienced than me. Um, I must say that both Mark and Diana uh, made my job both a bit easier, but also harder as uh, I can probably, I will say very similar things as they did because my conclusions from what's happening and what's been happening are very similar. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they also made my job a bit more difficult because they already actually uh, said the conclusions I would like to make in the end. So uh, let's see how this works. Um, we know that uh, since a couple of years back, we've been discussing the Fit for 55 and the European Green Deal files that were supposed to bring us closer to climate neutrality, boost our competitiveness, uh, give us a head start on emerging markets with renewables, with the heat pumps, with energy efficiency technologies, with uh, electric vehicles, and so on. Um, many of those files were already presented under the Slovenian presidency. Uh, the French presidency put a load of effort uh, into moving them forward. Um, and the EU aimed at steady pace with decarbonization uh, for some time. For some, uh, especially for the Central and Eastern European countries, uh, the, this kind of approach, the steady pace towards decarbonization that we did, uh, that we had, seemed a bit too idealistic in the sense that, uh, at least from our perspective, and my perspective is definitely biased because I do come from one of these countries, and the narrative is probably quite different than from what we hear either in, in EU or in more of the Western countries. Um, it's been seen by those countries in some cases as doing, for, exa for example, uh, or promoting renewables just for the sake of renewables and not for the sake of uh, half towards decarbonization. We also felt uh, that, at least especially Czech Republic, that uh, we're forgetting two main, main and very important things. Uh, first, being energy security, and that's in the recent times, uh, the strife slightly back towards this direction uh, made these countries happy in that sense that they could have said, I told you so. And especially Poland, they, they, they were saying this all the time. We need to boost our energy security. There are partners that we can rely on and partners that we can't rely on. And this is exactly what happened. The second one, and this has been raised by the CE countries uh, quite a lot, is the competitiveness of our industry. Uh, there was never doubt that we should go this path to go forward towards decarbonization, new technologies, renewables, electrification. But uh, what we heard from these countries usually was that we need either a bit more flexible approach in order to take into account our industry needs, not to destroy them, not to weaken them against the international community, uh, in order to make them competitive with markets and large companies that have completely different approach and different kind of support from their government. So this was the I told you so moment. <laughs> but let's get back to the past a bit. Uh, we were on the path on, of the steady, steady pace towards decarbonization, implementing negotiating all of these uh, renewable energy directive files, EED, oh, EPBD, uh, ETS, yes, oh, we love abbreviations in EU, don't we? Um, but then the war came, then the, then the Russian invasion came and realized that um, we probably forgot to, to push forward some, some other things as well, like the energy security I just mentioned. Uh, and in this... At these times, um, in the first half of last year, uh, at least I noticed very diverging thoughts and expectations of what's going to happen with the Green Deal, with the Fit for 55, and with our path to decarbonization. This also comes from my bias. I have no idea what, what happened in your countries or in your social bubbles, but I heard many times, uh, not from the government circles though, but I have many times uh, ideas or expectations that the Green Deal is finally dead because it's very expensive, it's difficult to push through, uh, or that it's it's weakening our competitiveness uh, as a continent. 
Of course, there were other voices and loads of them, and maybe even more in the end, that said, no, the Green Deal, uh, it, it's clear the Green Deal or just this path, decarbonization, uh, which will lead us probably sooner rather than later to more energy independence and independence in general and more competitiveness, uh, that this is the right path and that the, that the fact that we cannot rely on some suppliers uh, showed us exactly that. I would, in the panel discussion, very much welcome your opinions on this. What did you expect or what did you hear in your bubbles? Uh, was it slowing down or more flexibility in the Green Deal files? Or was it rather the opposite, that, that we will push it much more forward and that we will accelerate? We can now see, look in the back, and we can see that uh, the latter actually happened, that uh, we realized that more renewables can give us a bit more independence, head start, that we will not be reliable on some of the imported sources as, as much. And this is exactly what happened within the council and the commission. The commission, um, last year, they presented several repower initiatives. There was the communication, there was the plan, Still, even in 2021, when we believe that the crisis, the energy crisis, already started with some of the supply shocks, for example, uh, with not, not having enough gas that fueled or was one of the first indicators of the crisis. Um, the Commission also presented a toolbox of measures to mitigate this crisis. And later in the repower uh, communications, they presented more and more things that we could use in order to both boost our economies, uh, but also boost our path towards more renewables and decarbonization. There was a strengthening of the REDS directive and EED um, in the repower. And then of course, a bit later, well, much later came the council proposal or council regulation proposal for even speeding up permitting processes that even more boosted this uh, this path towards more independence and more self-reliance. Um, so we can clearly see that from this perspective, at least the EU or yeah, I would say the EU institutions realized that this uh, was probably the right path to go forward. But uh, let's get back to the CE region. Um, I believe that Diana wanted me to talk about um, about what was concluded in 2022 and what the CEU region probably sees as the way forward. Um, and this is a, a bit of a difficult task uh, because there is no one single CEU region. There are diverging countries with diverging uh, needs, uh, starting positions and opportunities. Um, and different positions. So from my perspective, I think that in this sense, not that much changed. Uh, we, all of us, all of the CE countries, we still push for roughly the same. Uh, we need more flexibility. We need to protect our industries. Uh, we need fast tools to respond to the IRA uh, that came from the US. That's That's been the second best thing after the energy crisis. Um, and this is what we're doing still. Uh, the only thing that changed is probably the urgency with which we need to conclude these things, these files, these tools, these measures that will help us in this way. And of course, from my perspective, at least it seems that in the EU uh, or the EU as, as a general uh, realize that maybe the idealistic way was or came a bit too early. Uh, in this approach towards decarbonization, that we still have a, have a ground pillars to build some stronger foundations um, in terms of having cost effective measures that will bring us where we want to be uh, and that will be much more resilient uh, against the crisis, both that they came and that might come in the future. So this can be seen uh, in several aspects. I will probably only mention one. Uh, several countries came back to using nuclear. We know about Netherlands. We know about Sweden that uh, their current governments realized that they will need uh, a bit more of that in the future. So right now they're developing plans for more nuclear development, for example. And me as a person from Czech Republic, I very much uh, support this approach. 
then we also realized that some of the fossil fuels will stay with us for some time. Uh, and even the commission said that at least for an another decade, we will have to use uh, natural gas. And that we do not have any other means uh, how to replace it. Uh, for some for some areas, we right now probably don't for the flexibility reasons. Uh, so that's what needs to be strengthened. But also, of course, uh, we realize that we need uh, measures that or tools that will help us get rid of the fossil fuels. And what we're missing now uh, is also reflected in the Net Zero Industry Act, but also in the um, in the um, electricity market design revision that came out. And at least from my perspective, the most important part is the strengthening of the generation adequacy to support for the member states to have more electricity power and definitely more flexibility as there are uh, even right now indicative targets for boosting uh, the storage potential, flexibilities, batteries, and so on. I know I've been talking for a bit too long. I'm sorry for that. I'm very much looking for the discussion, which will be much more interesting than my monologue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob. And uh, I'm sure there will be questions for you. But uh, since uh, Mr. Elio uh, has to leave us uh, soon, I will give the floor to him. Um, so Mr. Elio is the uh, energy advisor, is advisor for, for the DGNR on uh, local uh, governance. And um, and I would like to give you the floor to express uh, your views on uh, on the energy transition in this region, and uh, yeah, please. Okay, thank you, thank you, Diana, thank you, Mark, and uh, and and uh, Jakub indeed for kicking off. Uh, so uh, I'm even in a in a more difficult position now because uh, you asked me uh, to talk about the Green Deal, and you know it's uh, it's success in the in the three, uh, three years and i think we've heard many many good points on that so uh what can i do i will jump first into the helicopter in the sense that uh, we do remember a green deal i mean this was set up as a as a, as a growth strategy actually uh, to sort of make basically turn in, uh, turn these uh, big investments that we have to make into into the transition turn that into a competitive edge and uh, uh, in the um in the world uh, markets uh, since we will not be able to um, to uh, compete with uh, labor costs with Asians, for instance, so uh, the, uh, this is part of it, uh, part of the idea, so sustainability and competitiveness. Now there were three parts on that that you, you do remember, of course. So it's it's the uh, decarbonization, which the, the the big issue, but also biodiversity uh, is uh, it's there uh, as a uh, as an aspect, circular economy, and so on. So we're talking about many things. And uh, so, did it work out? Has it worked out so far? Uh, uh, the transition, Green Deal, uh, pushing the transition so well. You ask a commission official, of course it has worked. Uh, and and then we get to the caveat that well, there are some some uh, regional uh, variety or, or variations in this, which is which is a fact. And uh, um, it's uh, good then also to keep in mind that. Uh, this strategy was hit by two crises, one after each other, the COVID and the current uh, war in Ukraine. And uh, uh, I think it has survived pretty well, actually. It's put the acceleration at a higher gear. Um, and uh, and that's uh, uh, th that's like a sort of a good, good sign of it in, in the sense of uh, um, uh, reactivity, if we, if we uh, put it this way. And if you look at then uh, what's happened, so... Um, Obviously, we have uh, raised the targets on on issues relating, you know, from renewables to energy efficiency, and 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 uh, uh, and of course the uh, phase out from uh, Russian fossil fuels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's that part. There's been also more investment um, uh, focused on uh, on the transition, uh, as well as funding. And then if we look at some numbers, so yeah, uh, solar. Deployment, for instance, look at PV. Uh, last year, it uh, grew by around 41 uh, gigawatts, which is like 47% more than the year before. On the wind, onshore, offshore side, you had also very, very high increases uh, at last year, uh, in in particularly in, in sort of uh, um, relative terms. So I think the rest part is going going ahead. Uh, gas consumption came down. Uh, there was a reason. 
uh, of course, uh, because of the repower, we had to push it down. Uh, and uh, I would argue that it was not just because of the high prices, certainly the high prices and the, and the climate uh, or the weather played a, uh, played a role, but there were also some real savings, which are thanks to the, uh, thanks to the member states' um, uh, efforts. So somewhere around 20% uh, 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 um, lower the, um, the consumption figure in, uh, in, in uh, February. So now, um, what have we also uh, achieved here together? So we have a first ever fund uh, to address energy poverty specifically, um, the Climate Social Fund. Uh, we have a new fund which is set up for the just transition. And we have a, an initiative also um, um, for the uh, helping in the transition of, of the uh, coal and carbon intensive regions. These are the kind of novelties, novelties which have uh, been brought on the table. Um, the results of some of those will be seen in the future, so too early to tell, but quite relevant, particularly also for the uh, Central European countries uh, because of the um, coal, uh, coal industry and, and the, uh, the infrastructure plus the dependency, uh, quite high dependency on, on, on fossil fuels. So that's that. And, and like was mentioned here earlier, now the uh, new kid on the block is the Net Zero Industrial Act. So we're looking at now the competitiveness and the manufacturing of uh, um, of these uh, green tech uh, technologies in in Europe. So those are the kind of things which can be looked at as as generally what the uh, what the green deal has has brought with it. Now um, I think it's fair to say that then the success in the Central European region has been a bit mixed, um, uh, and and that's often because of these challenges, specific challenges that are there. Uh, in 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 many other countries, so it's about the energy system structures, uh, economic structures as well. Um, I think the uh, industrial uh, structure was mentioned here as well. So uh, there are these understandable reasons why uh, things have not always worked out so well. Although there are then also bright spots like uh, like Diana mentioned. So um, I think there I would I would argue that the the deal, uh, Green Deal has made a, you know, provided a kind of a framework for, uh, for a transition, certainly. Um, the, um, um, that, that's there. Um, and, uh, and I think I mentioned already the just transition mechanism. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's for the coal, coal part uh, particularly. And, uh, but then if we look at, well, how to deal with uh, this um, these special challenges which are in the central European region. So there are some obvious things. You know, it's like, uh, uh, for instance, taking the moment now to update uh, the, uh, the the NECPs, the National Energy Climate Plans. Also making the most of the uh, of the recovery plan uh, reviews, which are uh, taking place now, choosing the priorities in a way that you will accelerate those. Uh, uh, those uh, transition uh, priorities. That's oh, that's an obvious one. There's also some work to do on updating the national legislation to um, uh, to make make it easier. Say, for instance, renewable deployment. So uh, it's often about um, uh, administrative procedures. Also, some uh, legal provisions which make things difficult. Like I don't know. Um, Think about uh, onshore wind, uh, windmills uh, in, in in some of the um, uh, some of these countries, and uh, and this has uh, this has been complicated or slowing down this process. There's also the one key thing: modernizing electricity grids. Okay, good good place to put money in. I think we talk too little about actually the grid grid aspect. Often we uh, talk about all the other nice things, and uh, I forget that. Well, actually, that's pretty crucial. So. That's there modernizing also the, the metering system, smart metering and so on to get in demand response and so on. So there's a, a, there are things of that kind and, uh, and obviously we shouldn't underestimate capacity building because this is something, um, you know, in the local and regional and, and central governments, how to absorb, absorb the money which is available. So it takes people who know what to do with it smartly and uh, um, enough enough staff and enough uh, knowledge about how to run, for instance, green procurement uh, or, or things like that. 
I think, and then, yeah, one, one huge issue, of course, is the uh, awareness raising and the getting the political uh, backing to this transition. Like uh, this is this is super, super important because we're talking about the big transition. So, uh, um, and there it's getting the people and the stakeholders to participate in it. So not to be just on the receiving end, but actually participate. There are very interesting things happening in, in, in Flanders, by the way, on, on how to get uh, the people uh, participate at very local level, pretty much like street level. And apparently it works very well, ask, uh, ask the Flanders minister. Anyway, uh, you've noticed that the list I'm, I'm giving here, so I'm talking here about the Central Eastern uh, countries, but actually this applies pretty well in, in lots of other parts of Europe as well. So uh, it's, uh, uh, there are similarities. Um, Diana, I think you asked me to ask or, or say something quickly about uh, the consequences of in new investment in gas infrastructure, LNG terminals and so on. Well, okay, here you get the commission answer on the one hand, uh, on the other hand. So obviously, um, what are the consequences when uh, when we start investing in, uh, in, in, in gas, uh, natural gas I'm talking here about? Well, of course, positive and negative. So you have on the positive side, very importantly, it's about energy security now immediately. So it really uh, does make sense to do that, particularly in the repower context. So uh, that's one thing. Then it's clear that if you put that, compare gas with coal uh, power, um, yes, there are emission uh, emission benefits. And, uh, um, but, uh, they, yeah, and then the, the issue of, of backup power to, to renewables because of the volatility, that's clear. So uh, these are positives. And then you can look at the downside, uh, which is that I think there are also reasons to believe that this might slow down that decarbonization actually and, and the uh, reduction of the uh, emissions. Uh, because you're running uh, a risk of a lock in effect into into these kinds of large um, investments. And then, you know, keeping our mind, of course, that it is actually the fossil fuels that are the ones who cause uh, uh, these uh, energy crises and, and a price price spikes. So you rarely see those on the renewable side, uh, which I mean, that is a fact, though, if you uh, as long as you invest in fossil, generally speaking, you always have that risk that uh, uh, sometimes there is a surprise on, on on the prices because these things come from outside. They are imported. So that's the way it goes. And uh, on the electricity side, of course, um, renewable electricity is the low cost alternative, uh, generally speaking. So here you go. I mean, I think on, on this point of gas, so I guess, Again, you go into a case-by-case -case assessment uh, of the, the pros and the cons. You look at public finances. You look at also the jobs you're creating. Are they future-proof or not? Uh, you should look at things like health aspects and, and, uh, and well-being, a very sort of holistic assessment. And I think I will stop here because of some time constraints indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eero. Um, I think we have a good number of recommendations there and uh, about NECPs, RPs, uh, and uh, the electricity grid. For sure, we need uh, updates uh, all over Europe. Um, but I will just ask the, the audience if they have maybe some questions, one, one question or two questions for you, if you still have the time to, to answer. Uh, two minutes. Two minutes, yeah. Are there any, any questions for Eero? Uh, thank you very much, Jakub Gorzkowski, PG. Uh, I have a follow-up question to what you said in your last sentences. Uh, you know better than I do that European law cannot work on case by case. So as you have drafted this entry market design reform, uh, what is the message coming from the commission proposal towards, uh, for example, gas investments in CHPs, uh, also uh, taking into consideration the uh, need for uh, transformation of the heating sector in Central Europe, and not only Poland, also in our uh, other countries, to switch from uh, coal to to gas. That uh, is 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 the message that uh, this reform should facilitate the switch from uh, gas uh, from coal to gas in the heating sector, 
that has obvious influence on the uh, electricity market as well, or there are alternatives that we should consider here. Yeah, um, I think you probably sensed in the, um, how should I say, between the lines that um, I'm not particularly sort of encouraging this type of uh, investment, I think. Uh, that's about this, um, if you talk about assessing impacts and, and a particular bit longer term. So you probably would be better putting your in investments better into, into something else, which will be certainly a longer term investment like renewable energy or, or, or grids or, or uh, issues of that kind. And, uh, uh, and then there are some more con contentious issues uh, or, or alternatives, which I discussed, of course, uh, such as low carbon um, energy. So uh, um, I think I will leave it at that. And we were discussing the the gas, uh, the the gases uh, um, and hydrogen regulation still. So um, um, there are some there's some work uh, on that field. So perhaps it's better to get back to it later. Thanks. Thank you. Um... Maybe one question from my side, uh, and then I will let you leave. Um, you were saying at some point that uh, real result, results are too early to tell. We will see them in the future. Uh, we have on coal, uh, we have the coal regions. Uh, the just transition has started already there. Uh, at least the program is, is ongoing. There is a report from the European Court of Auditors saying that the results so far are quite mixed, uh, to be a bit more positive. So what is your opinion on on the results from this point of view and how long should we still wait to see uh, the, the results that we would like to see? Thank yeah, you. there's indeed a timing issue there. I think uh, it was a good thing that uh, um, the court of course uh, issued uh, uh, or audited the, this activity, I think, because this is really a high priority, this uh, court result. So that is, uh, uh, that's very welcome. Um, I think then the timing is the right word um, because uh, we, I would, I would say that commission's view on this was that um, generally at an audit, it's, it's very good if you, whatever you audit, you have a period of time, you look at that. So you should then look at the progress on that and, and according to the legislation, which was in, in place at that time on that particular area. So what, like the legal base, and I think here um, was a bit of a um, disparity in the sense that um, the audit was looking at 2014, 2020 period, uh, and the coal transition activities, including the, the you know just transition uh, um, mechanism and all that. I mean that started actually 2021 onwards. So there were some references there to. Um, um, you know, um, requirements, I wonder if I, I had looked at those a little bit. I mean, socioeconomic energy transition requirements, particularly in, in the coal regions, actually those didn't exist at the time of the audited period. So this affected <clears throat> a little bit, I would say, the results, you know, the validity of the results. Uh, and, and there was also questions about some of the funds, what they were supposed to do and what they, uh, did not at that time do like reskilling, for instance. So uh, funds like ERDF were not in that work. Uh, that was not the 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 their job, so to say. Today it is, and today we have uh, uh, just transition funds, others. So that's a fact. So I think the results of of this work you will be seeing now um, in, in in the coming years, and I think already uh, we've been some really good uh, feedback on the, for instance, on the coal regions in transition initiative. So there, there's a very good uh, work between the um, coal uh, regions in, uh, around the Europe. Great, thank you very much. Uh, it was great having you here. Um, and now I will, uh, I will turn to, um, just to get you the full overview from the institutional side, I will turn to Mr. Uh, Richard Paulik, uh, advisor for uh, MEP uh, Jerzy Buzek. Um, so 
maybe we can we can start with a sort of uh, an overview of what's happening in the European Parliament. If there was a sort of a shift of power now with the war in Ukraine, in terms of uh, the place that this uh, Central and Eastern European countries uh, take now in the discussions. And then uh, we can maybe discuss about the gas and the decarbon de gas decarbonization package uh, and how how the work uh, is impacting uh, the the Central and Eastern European countries. Good morning. Thank you very much for the for the invitation. And uh, I would maybe like to start answering your first question uh, to to. To, to try to look uh, in more general terms at the, our common European energy uh, policy, which I've been following pretty much at least since 2008, since 2009. And uh, I think from the very beginning, it was, it always uh, has had a very strong, uh, let's say central and Eastern European footprint uh, or touch. Uh, also because I mean, uh, some politicians, policymakers, uh, actors involved in creating and shaping this this uh, um, European energy policy were coming from from uh, this region. It I think it all pretty much started with the third energy package, which was actually adopted uh, under the first uh, Czech presidency in two thousand and nine, uh, and thanks to to great efforts of Czech presidency back then. Then afterwards, in 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 two thousand and ten, uh, there was a pro proposal of of Mr. Buzek, back then president of the European Parliament, together with actually uh, former president of the European Commission, Jacques Delors, of the so-called um, European energy community based on three pillars, internal energy market, a joint purchasing of energy from outside the EU and, and boosting um, innovation and new technologies in, in energy field. Then it was rebranded uh, kind of by by Prime Minister Donald Tusk uh, to the Energy Union, which was implemented by by Vice President Maro Shevchovich in the previous term of the of the European Commission. If you look at uh, energy commissioners, uh, I think out of four energy commissioners, uh, last four energy commissioners, two of them were from from CE region. The same in in the European Parliament in ITRE Committee, which is essential for our work. Um, on the energy files uh, since 2014, it's actually chaired by by MEPs from uh, our part of Europe. So I really think that it's not about lack of, uh, let's say, this this uh, CE approach uh, in the European energy policy. I think the problem we realized finally, I think all of us realized that that we have in the EU is uh, the lack of. Uh, European um, approach in energy policies of some EU member states. And uh, I, I don't want, and I think I don't have to name and, and, and shame them. We, we all know uh, who, who I am talking about first and, and, and foremost. Um, but I think, and I hope that, that uh, the lessons were finally uh, learned. Uh, I think it's also important to emphasize that, that uh, because it's, also some, sometimes questioned in, in some countries also of our region that that uh, actually it's not a mistake made by, again, by Europe, but by some member states and EU institutions, particularly the, the European Commission and the European Parliament was really very much always in favor of this, of this uh, common European energy policy based on, on solidarity, on, on um, well-integrated, well-connected internal energy market, diversification of uh, of energy uh, sources, joint purchasing, um, and so on. Uh, also, the vast majority of the of the European Parliament was always uh, very strongly against uh, projects uh, such as uh, the Nord Stream two, and uh, there were there were no hesitations uh, around this. So I think here, I mean, uh, there's a maybe not that that big shift the maybe two 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 key messages or um that or or something that is uh, somehow uh, discussed uh, or or shared now more even more in the in the european parliament first it's uh, that it's i think quite clear for the for the european parliament that after february 24th of of last year we like passed the 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 point of no return Meaning that, uh, I mean, if we talk about EU's future um, 
energy or EU's <clears throat> energy future is not about uh, no business as usual with, with Russia. It's rather about no business with Russia at all, full stop. Uh, and uh, for the European Parliament, I mean, I think one week or 10 days after after the war has started, there was a resolution adopted by the by the parliament calling exactly for uh, for for this. Now it's gradually um, happening, uh, and uh, and I think this is this is the way we have to we have to go. And this is perfectly actually linked with the with the second message, which was which was um, already raised by by a few speakers. That of course it means also that uh, I mean we what whatever we call it, is it the European Green Deal or the Recover EU or uh, differently in the future, we have to accelerate our just and clean energy transition. Both words are very, very, very important. Uh, it has to be just, just transition. Uh, of course, taking into account uh, new developments, maybe some new new challenges that arise, like, like for example, the question of Okay, to what extent gas can be, uh, should be the the transition fuel to some extent for for sure. What is the 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 rule, for example, of biomethane, uh, hydrogen uh, development, which 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 you already which you already mentioned, um, and uh, I think I mean it, it, uh, I think Jacob was 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 mentioning it about uh, the Republic. Uh, I think a little bit the same is in Poland. It's always a question if we talk about the the European Green Deal, if, is it is it dead or alive? Um, sometimes I have an impression that uh, if you take, for example, ETS two, which was also highly debated uh, in in France, for example, I I, I remember a statement uh, made by um, Pascal Canfin, chair of the MB committee. Uh, normally very very supportive for the for the whole European Green Deal idea. He said. It's a political suicide. Uh, what what uh, the commission is is proposing, but it was proposed in two thousand twenty one in, in in July, in the in the framework of the of the Fit for Fifty Five package, and then the war has started. And actually, I mean, if you if you look, for example, in Poland with the ongoing uh, solar power uh, so, solar panel uh, revolution or heat pumps revolution, I mean, it's not that much. I mean, people maybe even don't know what is. The European Green Deal all about. Uh, it's not about uh, EU directive. They simply, and maybe it's not even about being green or believing in climate change. Uh, I mean, which is important, of course. But at the end of the day, why a lot of people started to do that or accelerate it or also isolate their houses and so on is because they realized that it's uh, about being pragmatic and counting uh, your own money. You no, know? and uh, I. So from this point of view, it's a kind of paradox because Mr. Buzek is always repeating that the, the biggest enemy of the European Green Deal is actually Vladimir Putin, uh, but unintentionally, uh, with with the war he started, he actually became also kind of biggest supporter or accelerator of the of the of the whole process, and um, so I mean there, there are no positives about this horrible war, but from this point of view. I mean, at least people started to 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 perceive the the, the whole process and the whole transition from the very different uh, angle. To also see that it's about economics, about about energy security, and I think this is uh, quite important for the for the overall su success of the of the whole process. So maybe for the for the beginning, for the start, but I will, I will stop here and then happy to continue. And I think this is a good message: economics of the green deal. For now, they seem to work. Uh, so that's that's important. Uh, I will now turn to you, Michna. Um, you are head of uh, research at EPG, a Romanian think tank. Um, please share with us your views of the local uh, energy transition in Romania and Bulgaria, because you also look at, at Bulgaria. Um, and and then we we open to the questions after Alexander. Um, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, for the invite. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. So thanks, thanks, VP, for for this. And uh, also, uh, it's important to mention historically. I think for the last two centuries, uh, Romania, some countries in the Balkans are very uh, comfortable with with French leadership on uh, any topic. So very much uh, welcome our participation in uh, in this discussion. Uh, 
Uh, now, what I think is very important is that uh, if we discuss the reason of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, we don't have to just trade high level messages, but we need to actually uh, face some realities. I think it's very important to state that uh, the European Union's decarbonization efforts will only be as successful as the decarbonization efforts in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, in a way, I think we've had it easy with the 2020 targets, uh, both because of the pandemic, but also because of their level of ambitiousness. Uh, but as we move to 2030 and beyond, uh, it will be reckoning time about how policies that are discussed in Brussels are then later implemented in the member states. Uh, and of course, then I can try to bring some of the Romanian and uh, Bulgarian perspective into the conversation. Uh, it is important to understand that we're speaking of regions while which is while has distinct countries, they have some shared political economy traits that are different from those from Northern and, uh, and Western Europe. Just to give you a few examples, uh, there are countries where industry uh, plays a larger role in GDP uh, compared to more service-driven economies uh, in the West. Uh, it's a region generally highly reliant on fossil fuels, uh, especially coal and lignite uh, in most countries, uh, which of course requires a uh, transition period, which can look different uh, to those in other parts of Europe. Uh, and there are countries that need to uh, face at the same time uh, efforts of economic convergence to catch up with the EU average, while at the same time decarbonizing their economies. So of course, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in those regions looks different than it would uh, in, in Western Europe, and it's very important to acknowledge that, uh, and it's very important to try to take that into, into account in, in the discussions. Now, uh, having framed the importance of the topic that uh, we're discussing today, I wanted uh, to focus my intervention or two or three parts based on how much time I have, so please interrupt me if I speak for too long. Uh, the first one is about climate governance in Romania and Bulgaria. The second one is about their response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And third, if we have a bit of time, just some mentions on industrial decarbonization. Um, so in terms of governance, uh, we've, we've heard about uh, the revision of NECPs. Uh, with Romania and Bulgaria, an issue still remains the long-term strategies, with the Commission having launched infringement procedures for non-compliance with sending uh, these strategies. Romania has still uh, not submitted it. Uh, Bulgaria has submitted one which, to put it kindly, was relatively rushed and perhaps not in, in as good of a shape as it could have been. It's still in the process of, uh, of, being, of being revised. Um, and the NSCP revision comes at a very politically difficult moment in the two countries. Uh, Bulgaria has uh, elections uh, at the second, on the 2nd of April, uh, which will likely see a different coalition in government. Uh, Romania has this relatively stable uh, left-right uh, governing coalition, but uh, is more fragile than it looks. Uh, in May, uh, there's the expectation that the prime minister will switch from the National Liberal Party to the Social Democratic Party, uh, which may not go as smoothly uh, as anticipated. Uh, so the revision process will come in a politically difficult moment and risks uh, furthering the political lag that I dare say exists in countries like Romania and Bulgaria. Uh, what I mean by political lag is, for example, discussions on coal phase-out. Uh, the Bulgarian parliament has recently repealed uh, the greenhouse gas emissions intensity legislation for coal. Uh, Romania has adopted coal, coal phase-out legislation, but ever since it did, there were multiple attempts by both the government and the parliament to water it down or change it or to try to uh, alter the status of the coal units that were retired. Uh, the conversation on gas as a transition fuel still very much exists, especially in, uh, in Romania, and not much has changed, unfortunately, since the invasion of Ukraine in that regard. Uh, and just to give you an example, which I think is quite telling, uh, Romania and Bulgaria have reopened collaborations on building a new hydro dam on the Danube River for 840 megawatts, uh, which sounds like a project from the 1970s, because it is from the 1970s. Uh, it has just been literally taken out of a shelf in the conversations about uh, Repower EU and the new NRP chapter. Uh, the only problem is that this lag exists and we need to acknowledge it. So while in the North Sea we see energy islands and the hub and spoke concept, so which uh, you have this infrastructure that both enables countries to install more renewable capacities, but also to act as an interconnector between them. In Romania and Bulgaria, there's still conversations about uh, huge hydro dams with an immense environmental footprint uh, and basically sharing the capacities evenly. So not even to use it as an, as an interconnector. Uh, 
having said all that, uh, with this political act that exists, my expectations for the NACP revisions in those two countries are uh, generally to see coal phase out dates in them, which will be a huge improvement on uh, what happened before. Uh, at least 40% renewable target, which uh, the political messages seem quite clear at the moment, at least in Romania, that this will happen. Uh, hoping for a stronger governance framework, so not uh, to make sure that the NECP is not just a piece of paper, but it actually, uh, there is a follow-up and it, it is implemented, which hasn't been much of the case the, over the past couple of years. Um, hopefully some offshore wind ambitions, because modeling exercises done by us, done by Bulgarian colleagues have shown that uh, neither country can achieve these decarbonization uh, objectives without tapping into the Black Sea uh, as a source of uh, renewable energy, with Romania actually offshore potentially becoming the main source of, uh, of renewable uh, electricity. Uh, and of course, strong support for nuclear from both countries, uh, with Romania alongside Poland being one of the countries that uh, are the most advanced uh, in the conversations of installing small modular reactors. Um, very quickly on uh, the impact of Ukraine. Uh, what, what, what's important to mention here is that Romania and Bulgaria, I dare say, had a different approach uh, to countries like uh, Poland, uh, more cautious, uh, which I don't want to make any excuses, can be partially explained by the energy dependencies. Uh, Bulgaria, massively dependent on Russian gas imports. Uh, Romania, dependent by only 20% on uh, imports from Russia, but Russia is, historically has been basically the only supplier of, uh, of, of, that, uh, of that deficit. Uh, in oil, the same Bulgaria being exempt uh, from the ban, uh, from the embargo on, on, on Russian oil still refines it and even sells it to countries like, uh, like Ukraine. Uh, and over the, the winter, uh, Romania having significantly uh, imported Russian gas, which is because the pipelines in the South were still functional, mostly for countries like Hungary and Serbia, but Romania very much continued to import Russian gas in a very different dynamic to what we've seen uh, in, in the north of Europe. Now, there's been some diverse, diversification uh, looking towards Azerbaijan, towards Turkey for LNG. Uh, there are some encouraging flows there. Romania has expanded uh, its natural gas production with uh, tapping into its first natural gas uh, shallow water reserve. Uh, now they're moving ahead with plans uh, that by 2027, to drill into deeper waters in the Black Sea, which uh, is another important topic. We haven't gotten to speak about uh, methane emissions much, but uh, in all likelihood in this decade, Romania will become the biggest gas producer in the, in the EU. Uh, but to put things uh, on a positive note as well, um, we have also seen in the last year a massive uh, deployment of renewable energy. Uh, done both, both at utility scale by companies that did not wait for subsidies from governments anymore. They did them on market basis, but also a genuine revolution about rooftop PVs. Uh, well, you just need anecdotal evidence. You walk through the countryside and you see how in every village you'd find at least a few households that uh, have installed rooftop PVs. Uh, so the attitudes have shifted in a way also among the, the population. Uh, I think what's clearer now also in the region is that since uh, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, uh, the decarbonization objectives and the energy security objectives are more aligned than ever. Uh, I'm going to stop now because I know I've taken a lot of time. I can speak about industry later. Uh, I'm sure there will be some follow up questions. Key message I, I, I noted for myself that the political lag exists. We need to acknowledge it and, and also, of course, to address it in the implementation phase. So now I'll turn to Alexandra. Um, you uh, are director of the of power systems at Forum Energy. So we'll very much uh, be looking forward to your remarks, uh, especially on the um, on the electricity market uh, design reform. If you if you have some insights on this from the power side, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, really difficult to speak about the uh, region and all those topics after the panelists because. Uh, Certainly, we see that uh, the topic is very, very di divergent. What, whatever the topic we touch, there's a, a big discussion, and we need to close it in five minutes or 35 minutes with Q&A session. But also, uh, so I will start with my perception of what has been said, and also on CE region, but also on Poland later on. So probably I will speak more about Poland. But I will start with the CE region. And the region is very difficult to be assessed uh, 
especially when you live in one of these countries, because probably from the EU perspective, this is a problematic region. We are not delivering as much CO2 reductions or greenhouse gas reductions as the EU would like to see us. From the Polish perspective, or I guess from other countries' perspective, the problems concentrate totally in the different areas. So uh, when I think about the sea region, I, do, I think that this is, a, I would say, a shapeable uh, region. And whatever topic you will take, then you need to, um, need to add uh, specific countries. I don't see this region as something unique. I don't see this region as something uh, that, or the countries that cooperate on every each and every topic. And to give you some examples, uh, before the war, um, full-scale war in Ukraine, uh, when uh, I was talking about the region, I was talking mainly about Visegrad countries. This is not the case anymore. There's no visible cooperation, especially in the energy issues. Uh, I'm not see. I don't know how you see it from the ba Brussels perspective. I don't see it from the Polish perspective. Reasons are obvious. There's no single stance towards Russia in this group of countries. However, when I think about renewables, I think about Baltic states and cooperation of Poland, uh, Lithuania, and other Baltics when it comes to offshore. This is something very visible. And I would even add to this region Denmark or other Nordic countries because this is where the the current cooperation concentrates. Of course, other countries, uh, industries waiting patiently for Poland to get uh, rid of this tenage rule and wanting to develop both onshore and offshore winds. Uh, but when I think about decarbonization and coal, and especially lignite, I don't have in mind this region. I have in mind very different region, which is Germany, Poland, and Czech Republic. This is where the majority of CO2 emissions from the electricity sector concentrate. So this is very plastic. And to be very, very honest with you, uh, when I come here from Warsaw, I don't come to talk about this region. I can come to talk about perspective of different member states on certain issues. And that's much, much easier. Uh, and this is how the reality looks. And I think that I will also address two uh, points that were raised in the discussion. One is nuclear and the other is security. Um, when it comes to nuclear, it is very visible. It is very, um, it is topic that attracts attention, but it, it's not something that we discuss daily in Poland. I mean, uh, of course there are some, um, and even this um, and this idea to, to come up with an initiative to support possibilities of development of nuclear doesn't mean that this is something that, you know, keeps us busy 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Not at all. I mean, it is something that attracts media and public attention, especially because there's a big clash between some member states toward this approach. So I think that this is something that Poland is trying to do, is going into this direction, but it's the not it's not the main point when it comes to energy uh, strategy, which I will address uh, in a second. And when it comes to security, uh, my very general observation, having worked many, many years on gas issues and uh, also on geopolitics because I was working for the Polish Institute of International Affairs and I was dealing for so many years with Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, I think that when we talk about security at the moment, and I think that Richard also mentioned this, this is something that Poland and countries raised for, raised for so many, many years but I will not talk about Nord Stream 2. There's no need for that. I would rather point you, I would like to point your attention that from perspective of many countries in this region, security is something very tangible. It is not the idealistic idea that we need to be secure for the sake of being secure, but rather I would say that we think about adequacy in the generation mix, stability of the grid, um, cooperation with countries um, that we don't need to be historically dependent on. And this is of course case of gas, but also oil that was mentioned um, by Michna um, a second ago that uh, security is something that is very, very pragmatic. And I think that the this perception is now there in the EU. I hope so for that. Um, so very quickly about Poland, uh, Poland is, uh, is on the verge of, um, uh, of the transition, I would say. Uh, currently 70% of uh, electricity generation and 70% 70, 70 of heat generation 
um, comes from both coal, of course, um, in, in those sectors, and also from lignite, highly emissive um, fossil fuel. Uh, we will be, um, we will see new energy strategy coming in Poland very soon. It will be updated after the situation that we had last year. And I think that the main driver was the perception of gas. And gas is something that will be highly discussed in many countries. And this is uh, probably because it's very difficult to uh, leapfrog from coal uh, to renewables, not going with this gas um, as a transition fuel. But then uh, I think that it is very visible in Poland, and I'm trying to do it more visible as Forum Energy, to start talking about what kind of gas, for what sectors, how much, what technologies, uh, where we can get biogas and biomethane from, the potential is big, uh, what can we do with renewables hydrogen? Uh, is it possible to really get to fit for 55 or even, mm -hmm. uh, no, I won't say that repower targets in Poland, but fit for 55 targets for green hydrogen. So this is a big question mark, what to do with coal, which is actually uh, losing its ground already. Um, last year was supposed to be the back of coal year. It was not in Poland. The generation from hard coal was, um, I think it's, it was 5% lower, 5% in situation of crisis when we produced also to export electricity from Poland. Um, so it's happening at the moment. And that's why I said that nuclear, it's not the main topic because what we need is to secure uh, power generation adequacy in the short term. Nuclear won't happen in Poland within this de decade. Whatever we, we, we would like to see, uh, it won't simply happen. So what we need to do is to design the system to survive uh, 2020s de decade. And certainly I think that also I will agree with uh, what Richard mentioned that uh, all of the sudden, and this is good, uh, renewables, heat pumps, those kind of technologies are perceived in Poland as something very pragmatic. Very economic, finally, of course, they need support systems. But for that reason, you have 120% of increase of heat pump sales in Poland, which is the highest increase in the world. Um, and also, we installed close to 5 gigawatts photovoltaics last year, mainly rooftop solar. This is, uh, just to give you a comparison, capacity of the Hatuf Lignite uh, unit. Of course, they produce in a different way. Capacity factor is very different, but still, this is five gigawatts of PV in just one year. And I will uh, I will end up with one positive information. I think that we will see, and this is uh, already confirmed by the Energy Regulatory Office, by Transmission System Operator, and, and hopefully soon by the government, that we will see more than 50 gigawatts of renewables by 2030, hopefully even more. Um, and this is what is happening in Poland at the moment. I'm not saying that all things are positive. As Forum Energy, we are very critical of many issues, but still uh, what's happening with photovoltaics, what will hopefully happen with offshore wind <clears throat> is a revolution at the moment. Um, so thank you and looking forward to the discussion. Um, thank you, Alexandra. I... I think uh, we are really running late, so um, I will first just open the the, the floor to questions, um, and and I I hope we can touch on on some other topics uh, uh, through this question. So, are there uh, any questions so far? Good morning, Peter Hefele, Policy Director of the Martin Center. Um, we didn't touch upon the research part. Uh, we heard about uh, implementation, production, but what's the role of the EEC in the field of research? Me? Oh, okay, so let's, um, a first question, and then there was a second. Hi, hello. Um, I'm Mihai Darida from uh, MVM Group, Hungarian uh, electricity company. I have a question um, that I would like to address to uh, Alexandra and Richard, both because I really it really stuck with me uh, what Alexandra said about um, the discussion or the lack of discussion on uh, nuclear uh, power in uh, in Poland. Because as you mentioned, like I think many of us believe in this room that 
yeah, there's heavy discussions ongoing in, in, in your country about um, nuclear power and the introduction of nuclear power, which I believe is a, is a good sign. But um, I, uh, I would like to ask from you, Alexandra, what's going on with this, this discussion? What is uh, Forum Energy's position uh, on this? And to Richard, I would like to ask whether there is a, a political consensus uh, or a momentum to, to make a consensus or what is the, the, how the political scene reacts uh, to, to this and the people's perception in ge general? Because all I heard is that it's just in the making, but where 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 does it stand? Thank you. And good morning. Thanks, uh, Alexander Lungarov Institute for International Law, Kai Leuven. Uh, just a clarification for uh, Michnia. You mentioned uh, importation of Russian gas uh, into Romania last winter. Could you maybe elaborate a bit on the context? And you also mentioned uh, Hungary and Serbia in this context. Um, was there anything controversial there? Thank you. Maybe we can first answer these questions and then we move to the next one. So uh, for the first question on the role of research. Uh... Uh, I'll be, be very brief. I think uh, it's a fundamentally important point, which uh, is missed out completely. I can mostly speak for Romania. I think the NECP revision is a great opportunity to actually focus on that chapter a bit more in depth. Uh, all I can tell you is that from a... Uh, personal experience of our organization, it's impossibly difficult sometimes to even co-opt uh, institutions or companies in Horizon Europe programs. Uh, it's in terminal conversations, even for technologies that they need from hydrogen to carbon capture and storage. It's, uh, yeah, it's difficult. And the research institutions that exist, uh, they are not the most efficient uh, establishments uh, as most state-owned uh, establishments are in, in Romania. Maybe Michna on gas also? Uh, yeah, and, and on gas. Uh, so Romania uh, does not import, does not have direct contracts with Gazprom uh, and never had direct contracts with Russia. It was always uh, gas that was traded, uh, which ended up in Romania. But when you watch the flows, the pipeline flows, it is clear that the only direction it can come through uh, is Russia. Uh, historically, those imports came mostly from Ukraine. Uh, with the pipelines that basically cut uh, the Dobroja region of Romania towards the Balkans, but these were shut. Uh, however, uh, gas imports from Russia continue to flow from the south, uh, and because of the new interconnector that uh, uh, was opened between Greece and Bulgaria as well, it meant there were different routes that uh, that gas could reach Hungary. Um, I don't think there's anything uh, necessarily different or dubious than it has usually been. Uh, it's just that uh, there was more political openness to continue uh, trading energy resources with the Russian Federation from those countries. And Romania has been a uh, silent, but uh, let's say happy beneficiary uh, of, of, of this arrangement. What's different, however, is that uh, Bulgaria, which was far more dependent on, on Russian imports of gas, uh, has managed to strike some deals with Turkey for LNG imports. Uh, and both Romania and Bulgaria have struck some deals with Azerbaijan, uh, for increasingly uh, for importing increasingly more uh, gas for the southern corridor. Now, the only risk that I can mention there is that uh, there is the potential problem that we are replacing uh, dependency on one authoritarian regime with another. Uh, it's only a quick fix. It's not a long-term solution. Thank you, Mina. Uh, Alexandra and uh, Richard, if you want to comment on that. Uh, thank you. On research, I think it, it's a huge topic if, of itself, so hard to discuss it today. Um, I might, um, of course, see uh, countries um, does not have a very good track of reception of the plants. Um, let's say, for example, um, innovation fund, but it's happening. Uh, it's happening and it is visible more and more. And I think that it's coming from the industry also. Uh, in countries where uh, industry, as Michna mentioned, uh, have bigger role um, in uh, um, uh, GDP, of course, they are looking at, and I think that the carbonization and all those issues are very much touching the industry at the moment. So the high prices of gas, uh, um, CO2 footprint, etc., and it's visible that they work on several issues, and it's uh, also 
um, hydrogen um, or other technologies. Uh, but it's it's difficult. It's it's not an easy topic at all. It's easier to get money for, I would say, standard projects for many companies. Uh, when it comes to nuclear, it's I would say that this is. I didn't want to say that this is not the topic. It's not the most important topic. It's one of the many hundreds of topics when it comes to energy. Um, first decision to build nuclear power plant were taken by um, the Polish government back in 2009. So it's 14 years. We live with discussion on this topic 14 years already. So this is, not, I would say it's nothing new. It's a wait and see strategy at the moment. It is in the energy strategy. Everyone's waiting development of this and what will happen after the government uh, the parliamentary election this this year uh, but there seems to be a consensus but i will leave it for the sharp uh, so when it comes to nuclear and i would say this um, standard projects i'm not talking about smrs right now uh, so the um, environmental assessment is done for the first location the location is chosen uh, and the vendor is chosen there's the another project uh, with uh, two Polish companies. It's, I would say, uh, it, it has not been taken into account by the government previously. Also, the location is chosen um, and the, uh, the the vendor, the uh, Korean company this time is also chosen, but this is, you know, just the starting point. And uh, there's, of course, and it goes to the industry issue. Industry needs, industry is really in pain at the moment. Uh, we hear uh, from the industry that they need to uh, both secure um, reli reliable power supplies and also they need um, they need prices of electricity and heat which they can handle and there's a, of course issue of um, industrial heat so it brings industry to I would say quite bold ideas about more modular reactors which will be added to the Polish energy strategy. I think it's also to, to build on what uh, Alexander was saying, it's also about uh, drawing uh, perception and understanding uh, among business community in, in Poland in general that uh, there will be also a growing uh, role or a growing challenge of, of uh, carbon footprint of, of, of production of whatever, whatever good. And uh, maybe some companies are uh, to, to be honest they see that if they don't try to act on their own and just wait on what will happen uh, and what will be done by by government or, or big energy companies then at the end of the day there will be uh, there will be lack of uh, green electricity green energy for them and they will be simply pushed out from the from the uh, value chain uh, and will be lacking contract in the in the future. So that's one issue. Uh, second issue, I, I think. Uh, I mean, I'm based in in Brussels, but but my my understanding is that there is a we can say that there is a broad con consensus among uh, main political parties. Uh, it was also confirmed uh, even a few days ago by by Prime Minister Tusk that they they want to. Um, if, if they win elections in, in autumn, they, they want to continue the, this project. But as Alexandra said, uh, it's I mean it's something that was debated uh, already at least because in 2009 there was a decision. But I think this topic was for more than 20 years, as a matter of fact, uh, debated. Nothing has happened uh, yet, and even now, yeah, there are some moves, but but uh, but the question I mean there's there's still still no decision on on financial model. There is a decision on a localization and finding, right? But 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 it's so, so it's moving uh, slowly, and uh, and the biggest uh, issue is actually I think it was also raised here that that uh, the the most positive scenario of the government uh, they, they they say it will be ready by 2033. I think realistically it won't be ready before 2035, uh, which is quite natural with this kind of big project. Uh, and actually, the the biggest challenge we will have, uh, I think, it's in the second uh, half of this decade when we'll have to phase out some of uh, coal units because of the age, simply, and uh, we will face a, a big um, generation gap. So here, nuclear, 
now in, in, be, be, because because it's not uh, done yet it's not ready yet will not help us anyhow so this so, so i think this is the uh, the context but but i think the consensus is there and and uh, from this point of view i think it will be it will be continued and also i think the public perception is uh, very positive about about it it's uh, i mean there are other topics that you can gain political um support if you contest uh, but it's not, not rather nuclear if you start to attack it so 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 that and uh, just uh, i mean i know that you are talking about big research projects and and uh, but, but i think what we should also have in mind is that that uh, of course like research institutions uh, big big funds for for research is one thing but uh, the, the other thing is uh, the startups uh, which i think in poland particularly but i think in also some other uh, um, see region countries are developing uh, and and trying to look for different solutions and technologies which which could really help the the energy transition so i think this is also something which we should uh, keep in mind and not lose uh, from our eyes maybe just as a as a follow up question for uh, for mihna because we have heard that the industry is in pain and you have mentioned mihna that uh, in these countries, there is a higher contribution of industry to the GDP. Um, what is what are the challenges? So today we have the challenges of of the of the high energy prices. What are the challenges for the decarbonization of industry in in these countries, at least in Romania and Bulgaria, as you as you see them? Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the question. Uh, I think the problem is twofold. The first and most important is planning, which is in both Romania and Bulgaria. There's no integrated perspective on industrial decarbonization. Okay, we speak of heavy industry. Steel is very different from cement, uh, from chemicals. Uh, but just having that conversation going is something that's missing right now. And the other, which is something that I tried to avoid doing much in my intervention earlier, was to mention access to funding. But I think that is key uh, for both decarbonizing the current industrial base and for attracting new value chains. Uh, in the heavy uh, industry, in the energy intensive sectors, uh, we are moving from a policy environment where there was no incentive to uh, make those big uh, changes, technological changes uh, to direct reduced iron and steel making, or to retrofit with CCS and cement and so on uh, because of the free allowances. Uh, now we're moving to a very ambitious phase out calendar. So basically you move from a uh, no incentive to uh, a risk of a chaotic and disruptive exit of a lot of those industries uh, from the region. And access to funding is a problem. Uh, Southern Europe, at least, has been less competitive in things like innovation funding. There's no IPSI uh, in the region. So uh, these very much feel like they're instruments that are not working right now uh, in that area. And when it comes to the Net Zero Industry Act, uh, I think there's a similar story there if uh, state aid is to be leveraged uh, increasingly more for attracting value chains, even if the conditions in some parts of Central and Eastern Europe can be better. I think fiscal space, especially in countries like Romania, is relatively limited. That's not necessarily because of energy industrial concerns. It's just about how the general budget of the country is, is constructed. Uh, but without access to uh, a revised uh, multi-annual financial framework, without a EU sovereignty fund, uh, actually attracting investments in those areas is going to be relatively difficult. Again, a powerful message without a use sovereignty fund is going to be difficult for these countries. Jakob, uh, do you join this uh, this statement as uh, from the Czech Republic point of view? I would say I, I do actually, yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, we will need loads of investments and the access to them is uh, a bit of a difficult. We like to say that it's not difficult on the supply side, but on the demand side to find the projects that are interesting and developed enough to be able to apply and to bring any change. Um, but if I may, uh, I have loads of questions that I would like to ask the <clears throat> panelists rather than speak myself. Mm. Um, definitely, I mean, I said some, something very important about the development of the gas production projects, and I think that it might be very important for the region and for something that even Alexandra mentioned. Uh, I think that even in the past, Romania thought about developing uh, more gas production in the Black Sea, uh, and today, um, 
my question would be, do you think that this gas development might change dynamics in the region? And especially my question would go to Hungary. And this might be even a question for you or for the other panelists. Do you think that if Hungary had uh, more access to, to natural resources so that it wouldn't have to be dependent on Russia, uh, do you think that it would be more of a pro-European and anti-Russian anti country than it is now? Because from their perspective, as I heard many times from my colleagues and from the from the diplomats we talked to, it's a very pragmatic question uh, of energy security and affordable prices. But on the other hand, from other perspective, it's just populism uh, and, and an easy way out to be friends with Russia and to get an access to very cheap uh, natural resources. Thank you. I think the question, question goes, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I would start by, uh, I, I've been quite negative and I'm afraid I'm gonna have to be a bit <laughs> negative because uh, what I doubt about the uh, deep water offshore drilling in Romania is the capacity of the state to implement projects of that magnitude. Uh, so now the project is uh, co-owned mm -hmm. by OMV Petrom and Romgas. They're basically two local companies with no experience in deep water drilling. Uh, the previous op operator of the of the field was Exxon, which exited uh, last year for, for uh, a payout of uh, 1 billion uh, euros. So I think the dates that we're seeing of 2027, 2026 even uh, are outlandish. Uh, I think that the chances to see anything like this happen before 2030 are very low because of the lack of experience of the operators uh, with this, but also because, again, there have been no large-scale uh, energy projects in Romania since the fall of communism. Uh, it will be great to have it changed, but I'm not sure if this will be the way it will change. Uh, now, let's speak a bit about magnitude as well. So for the shallow water deposits that this year uh, started operation, last year started operation, sorry, we speak about one additional uh, billion cubic meter of uh, of gas, and for uh, the deep water, we speak about six best case eight BCM per year. These are not uh, life changing quantities uh, in the grand scheme of, of consumption. I, I I agree with your point about how this might change the political incentives for countries like Hungary, but the political discourse, at least in Romania right now, is that any gas that is produced there should and must not be exported, which is uh, also ludicrous in its own uh, right. Uh, there's this entire discussion about getting consumption ready for when the, the gas fuel becomes operational. So when everyone speaks about slashing uh, gas demand, we're speaking about uh, revitalizing the fertilizer industry. Somehow we're thinking about uh, expanding the distribution grid for gas uh, uh, to heat more homes with natural gas. We're speaking about new CCGTs because the big lignite company in Romania, their phase-out plan is based mostly on switches to those 1.2, 0 0.8 gigawatts CCGTs, uh, which I'm not entirely sure how they will function at the high enough capacity factor to reach those efficiencies for which they are, they are designed. So uh, I just wanted to mention what the political discourse is and not to get the hopes up too high about how this will change the patterns around gas consumption in the region. Uh, Uh, maybe we can take some more questions from the room, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Tony Gillen from MCC Brussels, a new think tank uh, in, in town. Um, I was really struck by your last uh, comment, Mina, um, about expanding uh, output and increasing consumption. And I wonder, because I think, Marc Antoine, you made a very striking point at the beginning about the need to for Europe, following the IRA, to simplify and increase the pace at which it's achieving things. And with such emphasis on demand reduction across Europe, has that blunted the ambition and the spur to investment? In other words, has policy been too idealistic and not ambitious enough? If actually we focused on the need to expand energy output, would that act as a helpful spur to investment as we've seen in China, for example? Uh, if I may have a question to you, Dan, and to you, Mark, uh, regarding the opportunities for cooperation between Central Europe and France that you can see uh, with regards to energy-related industry research, EU policies, or, and so on. Thank you. Thank you. A third question, maybe? 
Thank you very much. I would be, I'm uh, David Berman from Air Liquid uh, Company. I would be very uh, interested in the perception uh, in the Eastern countries about hydrogen, knowing that um, according to IRENA, uh, it might replace uh, by 10, it might represent 10% of the energy uh, demand in 2050, according to the Hydrogen Council, a bit more ambitious, 20%. So today it's mainly used as a feedstock far from being able to replace uh, natural gas for heating and energy purposes in uh, heat and power. So I would be very interested in the perception uh, in the Eastern country about the role of hydrogen in the future. Thank you. And just uh, to, to adapt uh, to adapt to this, um, in, in, in your region, what is the what is the role of carbon capture and storage, uh, especially as we aim to decarbonize industries? Where is it being discussed, seen? What kind of scheme is being considered for that? Um, it, it's going to play a key role at COP28 and the UAE presidency and I think the whole Middle East wants that and the US as well. Um, so how is that going to renovate in your in your area? That will be uh, just a, a quick question. And the second one is on the electricity market uh, design reform proposals that have just been laid out. What is it that you just don't like in that? Uh, or, or, you know, where you see your biggest problems uh, coming from your from your respective countries? Thanks. Maybe you can answer the question on the... I'll, I'll, I'll okay. be last, yes. Okay. Yes, thanks. Perfect. So maybe we can start uh, with Richard. Uh... Sorry, I'm, I don't feel I'm in a position to, to answer a detailed question about Hungary. What I can just say from our Polish perspective, again, it's our perspective is that that uh, for years, uh, and again, there was a quite broad consensus about it uh, among political uh, parties. Uh, our, the, the goal was very clear that we want to uh, phase out our Russian uh, the, the dependence on on, uh, on Russian gas. That's why uh, we started building energy terminal in, in 2005, I think, already. Uh, now we're talking maybe about uh, even building a second one. Uh, that's why uh, in late 90s, there was for the first time project of what is now uh, known as and, and, and actually delivered as, as the Baltic pipe, so, so gas pipeline from uh, Norway. And uh, a little bit like Alexandra was saying, I, I think in, in Polish society, but also the political class, there was like th this very um, common understanding and, and feeling that we really have to um, to uh, increase and ideally finally phase out the dependence on on, on Russia. There, as a matter of fact, uh, we were cut off uh, Russian gas by by Gazprom in April. So uh, the, the plan was that we will. Uh, not prolong the contract which was um, uh, ending in, at the end of, of last year and they cut us off even earlier. So this is actually a history uh, now. And uh, yeah, so so this is like our experience and uh, and our and our approach. So it was not about uh, having uh, even I mean we had some indigenous gas production, but it wasn't that much about mm -hmm. indigenous production. It's more about perception that we don't want to be. Uh, uh, dependent on, on, on Russia in, in this field. And um, maybe the question on, on hydrogen, because, because Mr. Buzak is, is, uh, is uh, working on it in the, in the, in the European Parliament on the, on the decarbonized uh, gases and, and hydrogen package. Uh, I think there is a growing also understanding in, in at least in Poland that hydrogen uh, will be important. I still to be very honest, uh, sometimes don't understand because uh, I, I, I feel that that uh, the perception of some people, SMRs are, for example, uh, well, we're talking about you know, some even like concrete numbers, how many SMRs we'd like to have by 2030. And as a matter of fact, technology is not mature yet. And I think hydrogen is much more uh, uh, mature. And in Poland, this perception is like sometimes when, when we are listening to some conferences and so on, that is, yeah, this is important, but in the future, uh, and of course it will, it, it's not about uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, uh, it is about future, 
but uh, with some projects, uh, I mean, you have to start already uh, already now. There is also sometimes uh, the discussion. I mean, whether we should go for hydrogen or or more biomethane. I think it's not either or. We 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 need both, especially if uh, um, in these new circumstances around um, gas in, in in Europe. Um, and of and, but but again, uh, talking about the development of, of hydrogen economy, I I, I think uh, well the the financing issue which was which was mentioned is is, is relevant here very much as well. Um, I think there the are very limited capacities uh, for public funding, for example, of hydrogen economy or new hydrogen infrastructure. Therefore, uh, Mr. Buzer believes that that uh, it's even more important uh, to, to look for some synergies uh, between gas infrastructure, hydrogen infrastructure, uh, in terms of reproposing, uh, for example, allowing maybe also uh, in some under some circumstances uh, cross subsidies to 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 boost the uh, development of this infrastructure but of course at the end i mean it's also important that what if, if we talk especially if we talk about green hydrogen low car low carbon hydrogen again uh, it's only when and if the the nuclear uh, power plant will be ready uh, if we talk about green uh, hydrogen we talk about uh, renewables i mean if there is no uh, uh, Sufficient amount of renewables. There is no green hydrogen. Uh, that's that's it. And uh, of course, there is a big, big challenge uh, there in Poland. I hope we will move there slowly in the in the right direction. And uh, uh, because at the end, uh, I, I think that there is an understanding that it's not about hydrogen itself. It's about uh, industry actually, which will be either done on hydrogen, green, or, or low carbon hydrogen, or there will be or this uh, industry will move elsewhere. It's also a discussion about IRA uh, to some extent in, in other countries. Okay. Thank you. Maybe. Thank you. I try to be brief, but electricity market design is, uh, again, you need to organize another discussion on that, on cooperation with Russia. To my understanding, and many countries proved that the uh, energy cooperation with Russia is a function of the policy of the country and especially foreign policy, not the other way around. So this is how I see it. But if you uh, talk with your Hungarian colleagues, you'd better ask about nuclear, um, probably. On hydrogen, I think the stance is more and more pragmatic. Uh, we don't know where the, I mean, I'm talking about Forum Energy and also discussion among experts, not the Polish government. We don't know exactly where the numbers in the repower come from. Uh, nothing new for you. Uh, we can see that uh, the whole current production of um, renewables in Poland would need to go only to production of the green hydrogen to be in line with 50% target in 2035. Poland is the third producer of the gray, gray uh, hydrogen at the moment, so it's a huge challenge. Uh, but when we talk about hydrogen first issues, renewables, 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 Second is no hydrogen for heating, especially for um, um, households heating, no hydrogen for heating systems, hydrogen in power sector only for picking units, and hydrogen mainly to industry. This is what is needed. And if something is left for other sectors, then need to be taken mostly by probably co-generation, somewhere when you use it most, um, most efficiently. On CCS, again, industry. Uh, it is not the technology for um, power sector. There are other technologies to decarbonize the system. It is too expensive. Efficiency goes down. Uh, we had this uh, um, CCS. Uh, I don't even recall the correct name. This platform where we were supposed to have tw 12 pilot units, including in Bełchatów. Uh, this is all that. But the industry, we see the, the, the industry very much um, looking into that uh, but i don't have correct yeah i don't know the the exact projects in poland but there are some on electricity market design i mean there was a much 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 bigger uh expectation on this but but you all know how the discussion evolved uh on marginal pricing and came, we came to support renewables but i think that in general poland is okay with this proposal um I haven't talked to anyone from the government yet, but the, the initial proposals 
when um, there was, a, I mean, we have a CFDs, con we have CFDs contracts in Poland under DPPAs are being developed. Uh, we see bigger need for grid developments and taking into account grids. Uh, uh, as Forum Energy, we are supporting nodal or locational pricing. And this was something that Poland put on a Brussels table many, many, many years back. And uh, also there is a huge issue on uh, um, adequacy. Uh, and we do have a capacity market in Poland and our stance is that it needs to support us so flexible zero emission units. Finally, in Poland, in the last actions, we are supporting batteries. So also, I think that Poland uh, has a good ex has a good experience with um, with some ideas that are put forward in electricity market design. But still, uh, and this is probably nothing new. This is not the market fit for 2050 um, neutral system, um, carbon neutral system, and that there will be a huge reform. Probably we don't know, and the Commission does not know yet exactly where we. Be. Heading, but a big challenge for the new commission. Thank you. I'll try to be very quick. Hydrogen um, in Czech Republic, yes. Uh, all colors of low carbon hydrogen, which in EU lingo means nuclear. Uh, in Czech Republic, especially mainly for industry, same as probably everywhere else, it makes sense. Probably not really heating. Alexander is totally right. Very inefficient. Uh, but in Czech Republic, also for transportation, we do have loads of plans for this, and especially in the co regions in transition, uh, most of their projects, seriously, most of their projects in the field of energy, uh, they um, they plan or they are aimed at utilizing hydrogen. Uh, and we also have all, already several pilot projects uh, in heavy transportation for hydrogen in Czech Republic. CC, CCS, uh, we always liked it, supported it, but we probably have no single project in this area and have never had. So, I mean, it's a good idea. We promote it in the sense that all promising technology should be allowed and supported, but from the economic perspective, it doesn't seem to make sense in Czech Republic. So very, very weak approach in this direction. On EMD, Oh gosh, how much time do we have? Seriously, uh, I talked to the Polish government. I can tell you what their position is, but no, I shouldn't. Um, what we don't like. Uh, Stay optimistic. No, but you were right. You were right. Uh, exactly. I mean, the the proposal itself um, is regarded as very positive. Uh, there is no revolution. And for some countries, this is very good. So it's just an improvement of what already works and maintaining things that uh, helped us go through the crisis. So I'll limit myself to the Czech position. Uh, we would definitely welcome more flexibility in the CFDs and the state support, because as you know, now if you want to use public support for this uh, renewable sources plus nuclear, you can only use CFDs in the future. Uh, the commission has a slightly slightly specific in understanding of what it means but for us it might be problematic and especially for nuclear where investments and financial uh issues are not easy this doesn't seem to be realistic then loads of technical issues that might work and might help us a lot it's a great uh proposal in terms of consumer protection uh, and their and the strength strengthening of their role in the active market uh, then we have this possibility to regulate prices in terms of crisis. There it seems a bit too rigid, for example, for us. Uh, what else is there? PPA, hedging of the companies, everything. Most of the things we think are, are great. We really do like it. And we seriously believe that it will improve the market, but it needs loads of technical tweaking, flexibilities here and there. We could discuss this for hours seriously. On Monday, we were sitting on this since, uh, from, from 10 to seven in the afternoon and it was just the first discussion where nobody had positions on everything so that's it yeah. Uh, yeah i'll be really quick so first of all i take your point but there is also a crowding out effect that we need to speak about especially when it comes to gas which is not uh, the usual crowding out effect because of access and funding is because of administrative capacity so in romania to make space for a lot of those gas investments a lot of renewable investments have been put on hold, or at least the ones that are publicly funded. Uh, very quickly, on hydrogen, Romania will publish most likely in April its hydrogen strategy, uh, which looks 
well from a production perspective, a lot of focus on renewable hydrogen, some mentions of nuclear produced hydrogen. Uh, the concerning part is the consumption. Those CCGTs that I mentioned earlier, the plan is to use hydrogen uh, to replace natural gas in them in the long term, which from an efficiency perspective and from basic laws of thermodynamics is a nonsense. Uh, and uh, they're also looking into that those gas grids that I spoke earlier about expanding them through the National Recovery and Resilience Plan uh, to be increasingly fed uh, hydrogen to be uh, replaced 100% with hydrogen after 2030. Again, laws of thermodynamics. CCS, uh, the state is moving a bit slow on this, but there is a lot of interest from the private sector, which is because Romania has a relatively strong uh, oil and gas upstream sector. So there's a lot of depleted fields. There's a lot of drilling knowledge and know-how, uh, which are very willing to apply. What I can say is that last week we've had the first public backlash to uh, the idea of a, a storage site, which was onshore. Uh, and the local municipality in the area where they discussed this uh, had a very strong reaction against such a project. So social acceptability is a key concern here. Uh, like Christy Market Design, I'm not going to go through all the things, but the general reaction for Romania seems that they are positive uh, uh, improvements. Uh, the one of the bigger sticker points is sticking points is the uh, inflexibility in regulating retail prices, which is a position that Romania has had in the past and will continue to uh, going forward. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, look, we are uh, just fourteen minutes late, so apologies for that. Uh, we'll end here with one word on indeed uh, uh, French uh, views on. Uh, uh, on the region and and you know what is in there so i'm not from the government of course so, but you know my best judgment is clearly i mean there's the political issues we've been discussing here and the emphasis on grids is absolutely key uh i think we have a, a leading uh, european tso that is uh, very very involved in all the industrial dimension uh, behind that and that knows very well that you know all the equipment the electricity equipment supplies for that and and uh, and the raw materials are, are really short and and that there's a major issue for cooperation here um of course the small modular reactors and also the larger reactors uh, uh, you could also mention offshore wind i think there's great capabilities on the french uh, corporate side uh, in this aspect uh, biomethan clearly um Everything related to uh, flexibility tools for the for the electricity system, so battery storage, uh, pumped hydro, and and the last uh, key item I, I maybe mentioned here is everything related to industrial decarbonization because there's a lot of French industries that are present with huge investments and uh, and huge uh, capital stock installed in in most of these countries. So everything related to CCS uh, hydrogen. Uh, ammonia, of course, uh, matters a lot, and 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 the corporate PPAs in that respect. Um, what are, and, and lastly, but not least, I think uh, there will be also some uh, strong interactions to work towards the reconstruction of Ukraine, and Ukraine will be a major ex electricity exporter at some point, and it could also bridge, by the way, in Poland, the time between uh, the phase out of old uh, nuclear power plants and and the uh, sorry uh, coal plants, and then the, the new ones coming in, but. Uh, there needs to be capacity, of course, expanded, etc. Anyway, I'd like to thank you so much uh, for all coming. I'd like to thank our speakers for coming a long way, uh, for, for many of them are here. I'd like to thank uh, Diana uh, for, for our moderation, Aurelia, for bringing us all uh, together here and arranging everything, and, and you uh, for coming. And uh, just two words on our forthcoming publications, pay attention. So one will be on, on Central Europe and the Green Deal, not a surprise. And another one on, on looking into the new LNG training routes and all the geopolitical aspects that are related to these. And all this uh, will come out in a few uh, uh, days. So uh, you'll be informed and receive an email uh, with that. Thank you so much. And uh, enjoy the day and uh, uh, have a safe uh, way back home uh, for those of you who have to travel. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.